<laughs> okay, great. So now I guess uh, another easy question. <laughs> that is, from a scientific slash neuroscientific point of view, is it plausible to talk about a self well, in, ter in terms of the, the human mind or how the human mind works? Yeah, I mean, I think that there are, that when we use the expression of self, that there are actually many functions involved. I mean, some have to do with awareness of the body, some have to do with autobiographical memory, some have to do with uh, recognizing your current state of emotion or mood or, or metacognition, where you know that what temperamentally that you're like um, or what personality features you have. Those you might say are all part of, of self. But, you know, there's a sense in which, of course, Hume was right. That is that there isn't a single thing, either in the brain or, if you like, in the mind, that is the self. And um, I don't know whether Antonio Damasio thinks that there is or not. I think that he thinks that it's multidimensional. Um, but, but why it, he thinks it's tied to consciousness, I'm not quite sure. Because some aspects of those, um, uh, of the of self, namely a sense of body position, for example, sense of balance, sense of whether you're hungry or thirsty, Probably lots of, of animals who may not be conscious uh, actually have those. But um, which, what is the kind of self that uh, gives consciousness? Well, John Searle seemed to think that Damasio was saying it's the kind that gives consciousness. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> so Searle accused him of a kind of circularity. And uh, um, so, and and it's hard to sort of dispel the idea that there is no circularity involved there. That his understanding of how it is that the notion of a self gives rise to consciousness, uh, without having already being conscious, self-conscious, uh, it's it's a puzzle how he how how that's supposed to go. Um, and I'm sure he will explain that. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and this was specifically a central theme of one of your books, that is. Uh, so, we know that there are very specific areas of the brain that are pretty well mapped, I think, uh, that process uh, moral, moral emotions and moral sentiment. So, uh, in what ways is this important? to understand morality, that is, uh -huh. uh, that, that is, is it just to explain um, our, the biological basis for our evolved morality, or should we also use that information to inform a moral system? No, it's a really interesting question, and, and I suppose it's, I suppose it's part of both, but I, I mean, on the one hand, of course, I, as having the scientific bent, I've always thought that it's important to find things out for their own sake, and whatever practical value might come, you might not be able to envisage. And again, if I may refer to Crick, I mean, he was fond of saying they had no idea whether there would ever be any practical outcome of understanding the helical structure of, of DNA. And he said they certainly had no thought that it might ever be used for forensic purposes. Um, so, so that's part of it. But, but on the other hand, of course, I also sort of think that it's important for people to understand that even though they may have feelings of great certainty with regard to their ideological convictions or their moral convictions, that there is a biological basis for this. 
and that disagreements between individuals may obtain not because one is you know is stupid and the other is wise although that could be it might it might help to understand that there can be biological reasons for this and um, so in my new book one of the things that I am concerned about are those features of our biology that help us understand why there can be significant differences between individuals and what their conscience tells them, even if they grow up in the same family. Um, and I think if we understand that, maybe it will help us negotiate in a more practical way with people with whom we disagree. Um, I mean, it's sometimes very satisfying to see the opposition as just a bunch of numbskulls. But on the other hand, if we have to live together and we have to negotiate solutions to problems, it's probably better that we don't indulge ourselves in those things. Um, I think, for example, it's really important for us to try to understand the nature of between group hostility. What's that really all about? Some of it you can sort of understand, but a lot of it is just deeply puzzling. And so, um, so there are there are things that I think science can teach us about that, and about other aspects of aggression, for example, things that we really don't yet understand at all, that that might be helpful as we live in what is an increasingly dangerous and frightening world. So, so I do think that there can be a practical outcome. I like to think that it would be an outcome that would be for the good. Um, and that would be my hope. But I wouldn't let that hope sort of color my understanding of the nature of the discoveries themselves, if you see what I mean. Um, I think it's really important to be as objective as you possibly can. Now, I know that we're all, we all still have our biases and our backgrounds and our experiences and our temperaments and so forth, but you can still try to be as objective as possible. And when we do have to get along with people with whom we have tremendous disagreements, it is really important not to think that somehow God told us what the right thing to do is, and, and those guys are just heretics. And that has been in the West a kind of long tradition. Uh, and it, it's caused a lot of trouble, actually, as history documents only too clearly. And you know, the person who was a great hero of mine from the very beginning of the time I did any philosophy is Socrates. You know, you think, oh, oh, Socrates, he never wrote anything and he just kind of stumbles along. But, you know, on moral matters, that was, that was where he really was incredibly wise. And what worried him always was that there were con men who would take advantage and manipulate others and that we would delude ourselves into thinking that our feelings of certainty gave us the right to do terrible things. And I think on both of those points, Socrates, you know, bless him, he hit the nail on the head. And those are still issues now. And those are social, practical, practical issues of life and not necessarily issues where science has anything additional to tell us except that it's very unwise to allow yourself to be conned and it's very unwise to allow your feelings of certainty to cause you to do catastrophically awful things. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and do you think that uh, if neuroscience ever is to prove definitely that um, through genetics, through influences coming from genetics and, and the environment, 
there is not really something that we can call free will, that all that happens in our brains and our actions that, that come from that uh, are 100% determined that we should still keep the notion uh, of free will and personal responsibility j just for the sake of the, of the good functioning of human society. Well, we already know, of course, that the genes don't, don't determine every aspect of our behavior. Um, so, so even, so, so that isn't really a, that isn't really a, a realistic thing to wonder about. Um, we know that there is such a thing as self-control and we know that kids can, can be taught self-control, that some people are, find it easier to learn self-control than others, just like some rats find it easier to learn self-control than others. Um, and we have some idea of the mechanisms, but only a very, very slim idea at this point, but we will acquire more. And um, we are learning about the nature of decision making. We know that individuals don't just pay attention to the consequences, but in fact, decision making is a constraint satisfaction procedure. And that there are many constraints at many different time scales and that past memories are important and current perceptions are important, uh, evaluation of the consequences, values are important in all that. This is why, you know, utilitarianism is, is really a kind of um, confusion because it says basically there should only be one constraint, it's evaluation of the consequences. Um, and, and, and that's not how decision making actually works. And that's not how good decision making actually works. So, so I think as we understand more about that, um, we can, we, there, there, there's obviously a place for holding people responsible for actions that, that they took. I mean, you know, consider Bernie Madoff, who ran a Ponzi scheme worth billions of dollars. He ran it for over 20 years. Now, you can't really say that that was, you know, genetically programmed. Uh, I mean, that's pretty tough. Um, but, uh, of course, you should hold him responsible. And, uh, yes, uh, but, but uh, sorry, just to interrupt you there, but if someone is to say that uh, by including the environmental inputs, the brain, uh, uh, by the way it is structured, uh -huh. can only process the, those specific inputs in that predetermined way, let's say. Well, that's just to say that if there's a causal explanation, then the person didn't have self-control, and that's just false. Mm -hmm. There can be a causal explanation even when you have a tremendous amount of self-control, as in the Bertie Madoff case. Um, so some people have this idea that if there's any, if, if an action has causal antecedents, it can't genuinely be free. Where the hell did that come from? It came from Descartes. Well, geez, I mean, come on. Hume knew that that was nuts. And he said there are, there are different kinds of causes that are relevant to determining whether an action was voluntary or not. Um, so that, for example, if you accidentally fell and knocked over a, a, a torch that set the barn on fire, then you caused it all right, but we don't hold you responsible for it. It wasn't voluntary. So there were causes. But there are other kinds of causes, the ones that are internal, where, you know, you have certain beliefs and certain goals and certain aims, and you go ahead and you, do, you run a policy scheme for 20 years. Um, and it's unrealistic to think that we can hold nobody responsible and everything would be just tickety-boo. I mean, you know, humans are not like that. Um, so it isn't an option. Mm -hmm. You can't dismantle the, the, the criminal justice system. You can modify it in certain ways, and, and it is being modified all the time. Um, but you can't just say, well, hey, you know, people are caused to do what they do, so let them all go. 
Open the doors. Open the prison doors. I mean, we know what happens when you do that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But uh, would you say that uh, from trying to put it in a purely neuroscientific perspective, would you say that uh, the reason why we don't hold other animals personally accountable would be that uh, in the case of humans, we have the most developed prefrontal cortex that, that allows us to have agency uh, and, to, uh, uh, and to think and rationalize before we perform a specific action. But we think animals do that too. Even rodents can do that. Even rodents have self-control. They can defer gratification. They can stop an action once started. Uh, they can predict uh, the consequences of an action and, and suppress the action if they think that it's, it's not desirable. And, and they use frontal structures plus the, the reward system plus the hippocampus in order to do that. Um, so, and we do hold animals responsible. If my dog, you know, jumps up on the table and helps himself to the to the steak, he, she gets punished, and then she doesn't do it again. Um, you know, I do I put her, you know, do I let her call a lawyer and you know put her in jail or something? No, 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 no. but but uh, of course we do. And uh, that's part of what goes into animal training. But, you know, we train each other all the time, too. Somebody will, will do something really unfortunate or, or thoughtless, and if they get called out on it, then they, they're apt not to do it again, uh, especially in a small community. I mean, you know, we live in a very small community in the summer, and people are acutely aware of how their actions will impact other people because they... You know, they don't want to acquire a reputation for being, for causing people misery or for being thoughtless or doing things that, that um, are, are considered antisocial. People are acutely aware of these things because they don't like to be punished. And there are many, many subtle, small ways, even in a small community, of punishing people. You know, you, they, they cease to be welcomed. They're shunned. They... You know, things don't work out quite so well for them when they're trying to find a contractor and so forth. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, well, look, these things happen all the time. It's only when something is a really big, major thing um, that because we're a large community, we have these big social institutions like a criminal justice system. But hunter-gatherers managed extremely well. Otherwise, you and I wouldn't be here. Uh, they managed their their uh, social affairs very well, and it often involved, you know, small kinds of punishment. Sometimes they had to get rid of people. Um, and, you know, the, the anthropologist Franz Boas amongst the Inuit, for example, had stories about how they thought about what to do and considered talking to other people and finally realized that, you know, this man was a sort of compulsive murder, and he had to be executed, and they did it. So, uh, yeah, I, I think, uh, I, I, I think it, it's a bit odd in a way to say we're the, you know, we're the only ones with a really highly developed frontal cortex. I don't know. The more I learn about rodents, the more impressed I am with what, the, what they can do. Um, but poor old Jerry Fodor, if I may malign him once more, I mean, he used to say, humans are all, the only ones that can think. For all of the rest of the animals, it's just reflex. Mm. And it, it, it is so deeply, dazzlingly wrong. Um, our brains are so similar to the brains of every other mammal. Uh, we have more neurons. But, you know, we got all the same stuff, all the same neurotransmitters. They got a hippocampus, we got a hippocampus, you know. Uh, they have frontal structures, we have frontal structures. Yes, ours is bigger, but, you know, we don't have any unique structure that we know of. And anatomists 
you know, have looked fairly hard. Now, it doesn't mean it's not there at a more, you know, refined level that we haven't been able to see anatomically. That's possible. But, uh, and, and, and humans can do lots of things that animals can't do. But maybe that's just because we have hands. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Those are very interesting ideas there. Um, and where, uh, do you think that the discussion between reductionism and emergentism is really useful from a scientific point of view because i mean there are people who say that uh -huh. uh, that it is pretty clear that in the future we will be able to explain the structure of the universe down to the subatomic level in all detail and then that it is only a matter of scaling up or scaling down from subatomic particles to atoms to molecules to the brain, to psychology, to economy, <laughs> and, and politics, yeah. and all of those things. And then there are the side of people who defend emergentism. But what I get from them is that they believe that there will always be some kind of spooky thing going around there <laughs> <laughs> that, that people will never be able to explain. But uh, do you think that, that those extreme positions, let's say, are really useful to talk about these things, these scientific issues? Well, I mean, one question to ask in that context is, what difference would it make to my scientific enterprise or my philosophical enterprise to adopt one or the other? Would it matter? Would it make any difference at all? Or is this just, you know, the kind of conversation we have in a bar after we've had about four beers? Uh, you know, really? Um, see, I can't see why making a choice one way or the other would make the slightest difference to anything that I'm learning sort of every day at, about the nature of the brain. Um, so if somebody can show me why it would really change my scientific behavior, I might be interested. But if this is just kind of, you know, metaphysical bullshitting, uh, then I think, well, you know, okay, there's a time and place for that. Um, and it's usually late at night after, you know, a hard day's work where, <laughs> where you're in the bar. Uh, but, uh, quite honestly, it doesn't, ha it doesn't affect any, the way I think about anything. Um, I'm going to take every scientific discovery seriously. There's a lot of scientific speculations I don't take seriously because they're just speculations. They're people spouting off sometimes because they don't want to do the hard work of do actually doing the science. It's easier and cheaper and faster to just you know, put out a speculation and write a speculative book. And I, I don't actually want to waste my money on that. Um, and I don't want to waste my time with it. But, but you know, maybe that's because I'm old. I mean, maybe if, if one is younger, you know, speculating about these things is really fun. Um, I just find it a waste of time. Okay, I, I, I just wanted to ask you because I've been recently through uh, through a series of videos that, that only recently I came about. I didn't know it, it even existed on YouTube that of uh, a three day uh, three day workshop put up uh, organized by Sean Carroll with uh, ten oh, yeah. tw uh, with 10 or 12 people called uh, moving naturalism forward or something like that right, right, right. <laughs> and it's really incredible how through 10 sessions of an hour and a half each uh, people can go on and on and on i know it is interesting i mean you know can't they play golf can't they play tennis <laughs> yeah i mean why are they doing this <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. There's lots of things to do. Why, why would you want to sit around and listen to someone, you know, talk about you know, crap coming out of his head? I don't know. Well, um, well, well I, I did it, so I guess I will keep quiet about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that might be your job, though, you see, given that you uh, have this this program and that you have a blog and so forth. You probably have to listen to it and see what these guys are up to. 
<laughs> but I had the luxury of knowing these people and thinking, you know, I think I really need to go fishing today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, but but I have to be honest. Sometimes I also ask myself that, and even about the people that are there throughout, like fifteen hours talking about those things. I mean, so. I think one thing is really interesting about brain development, and that is that even identical twins don't end up with identical brains, yeah. and that. And that's because there's a lot of kind of um, micro decisions that are made where this neuron branching in just this way and that neuron branching in just that way that mean that it, the, it, the end result is that the brains are a little bit different at birth. Um, and then, of course, they can get, get more different as a result of experiences. So when we talk about explaining in great detail what a person's going to do or think or say or what have you, you have to kind of remember that there is this practical problem of finding out what all the neurons are doing. And, a, and functional MR is not going to tell you that, needless to say. We don't have any technology that can. Uh, if you don't mind my putting in micro electrodes all over your brain, uh, maybe we could make some progress, but I don't think you really would do that. And I wouldn't do it to you. So, so for, for really interesting practical reasons, both having to do with the technology, but also having to do with ethics, we may get general explanations of the go of the thing, ones that we don't have right now. But to get a highly detailed explanation of exactly what you're going to do, millisecond by millisecond, I think at the moment it looks very unlikely. Mm -hmm. And do you think that if someday in, um, in, of course, we, also, we already live in a highly developed scientific world, but... Uh, in an even more developed world in the future in terms of science, do you think that there's any risk of philosophy becoming obsolete or redundant? Well, it depends on what questions they're asking. If the question is how to make consequentialism work, then I think it's doomed. Um, if the question is how does spooky stuff work so that I think, then I think it's doomed. <laughs> but if the question is different, if it's um, a question about the nature of problem solving, for example, and how to synthesize what we know at a neurobiological level and what we know at a psychological level, then I think there's real work to be done. But, um, but you can't do epistemology anymore by pretending that we don't know anything about how the brain knows things and how the brain imagines things. We know rats imagine a route through the maze or a route to food because we can record from the hippocampus while they do it. Um, so, so hippocampal knowledge of spatial things and where reward is and so forth may be much more important to understanding knowledge in general than, you know, some book about, uh, I don't know what, what epistemologists write about anymore, but about necessary truths, truths across all possible worlds. I mean, oh, my God. You know, I, if you really want to understand how an evolved structure like a brain and works, then it really matters that you take the data seriously. But if you just want to make it up, then by all means go make it up. But don't expect me to take it seriously. Mm -hmm. And is it um, a plausible question to... Um, to question about what are the implications of uh, the knowledge we acquire from neuroscience 
and the fact that we all that we are completely material beings uh, what implications does it have to the meaning of life from a human perspective well I think those sorts of questions have always been asked regardless of you know how you think about things I mean um, and, and here I really you know find Owen Flanagan's discussions of the uh, Asian philosophers very interesting because here are Confucius and Mencius who ha there was no provision in their scheme of things for a divine power, no God. Um, so there was no God that was somehow the source of moral laws. They didn't even think that moral laws were what it was all about. They thought it was about the virtues. Um, and, um, and they did ask questions about the meaning of life that they gave as good answers to as, as most people today give. I mean, when, when Dr. Phil is asked these sorts of things on television, you know, he says the same old thing that people have been saying for thousands of years. The meaning of life has to do with, with love and family and meaningful work and, uh, and making a difference to your, to your community. And what lives on is the difference that you make to your family and your community. What lives on is not some spooky little thing that, that zips on up to some, you know, other place. Um, so, so I, I, you know, I think those questions, I mean, obviously they're questions that all of us ponder about, like, you know, what's the point of it all? And the answer is there is no point of it all. We are biological organisms. And, and then you think, there is a way to revel in the fact that we are all biological organisms, that we have this wonderful kind of connectivity to everything that has a nervous system. But not just that, but to everything else as well. And um, so I don't know. That, that, the connectivity to, to biology and the fact that, you know, I can look at a whale out in my bay fishing and think, you know, your brain, you have a lot of brain there. <laughs> it's the same as mine. Just the same. And, and, and I find that very moving. Um, not everybody does, and I don't always every day, but, but sometimes I do. And being a biological organism and really kind of reveling in my biology is kind of a, a cool thing. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I was just asking because this is a, a question that comes up very frequently in, when we talk about naturalism and materialism because most people that are not really uh, intellectually or philosophically minded, let's say, worry a lot about these things, right? Yes, of course. And I, I think it's entire, entirely reasonable. And... Um, and, and I think, you know, the answer that people have given for thousands of years, namely it's love and life and work and family and connectedness and the good that you do. And that's all that lives on. Um, and yes, when you are alive, you love life and, and you want to live it to its fullest, but then you know, part of being a biological organism is that what you can leave behind are, is the good work that you did. There isn't anything else. Mm -hmm. Or the bad um, that you did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, sure. And I, I, would say, I would personally say that even the fact that we get to know through science and neuroscience and all the scientific disciplines that uh, all that these things that we think about uh, love and all the moral sentiments and yeah, so yeah. on are grounded in reality it sort yeah. of gives meaning to them it does. it does i mean to me it does but i realize that it's not true for everybody and that's partly why i wrote the book touching a nerve was that i realized that that 
I had lots of friends and, and especially students who, who would say, you know, if you think that you're just the brain, and doesn't, doesn't that freak you out? And um, it really doesn't. But then, I mean, maybe it's just that I've been thinking about it like that for so long. But the other side of it is, as I said, um, that that I find it very easy to revel in my biologicalness <laughs> and 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 to feel that I have this special connectivity with all biological things. Which isn't to say I get goofy about it. I do kill a wasp. You know, I don't like wasps. Uh, I was stung by one the other day, and dog got it. I, so it's not like I, you know, get silly about it. But, but the sense of connectivity is what grounds me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So I would say that's a very good note to, end, think, uh, okay. to end on this interview. So, uh, uh, Dr. Churchland, just before we end this, would you like perhaps to share with people where they can follow your work on the internet, um, perhaps uh, the social media where you're active or not? And uh, I don't know if you're perhaps working on a new book we, you would mm. like to share with people or not. I do have a new book that has just been sent off to the publisher. It's called Conscience, the Heart of the Brain. Mm. Um, I have a website called patriciachurchland.com. Uh, I don't use Twitter very much, and I almost never use Facebook. But occasionally, there'll be something that I'll send out on Twitter. And my Twitter is at Pat Churchland. So, uh, but thank you for asking. And it's mm -hmm. been a pleasure. Yeah, it's also been a pleasure to talk with you. And I and again, I would really like to thank you for taking the time to be here with us today. It was really a very pleasant and informative conversation. And I, I really love your book. And your oh, book. Good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ricardo. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming to my channel and for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel last February and have been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. To keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge. Any amount, even one dollar, would already be a great help. Otherwise, if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett and Per Helge Larsen. Thank you for all.